and I blame the Southern Californians for our governor, not, uh, not the Northern Californians. Um, so you can see the Galileo probe here. There's the antenna. It's actually shown unfurled here. And there's a, there's a boom here with a magnetometer reads the magnetic fields and different cameras and different things on it. But there are two separate booms. There's one here and there's one on the other side that's not shown that has these RTGs on them, these radioisotopic thermal generators. And what these are are containers that have plutonium in them, plutonium-238. And what happens is the plutonium decays and generates heat. And you can turn that heat directly into electricity. It's not a hugely efficient process. But um, it only takes a couple of hundred pounds of plutonium to do this. So what the heck? Actually, no, it's about, it's about uh, 70, I think it's 72 pounds of plutonium per boom. And so there's 144 pounds divided up into lots of tiny little sections. Because what you don't really want to do is have a lot of plutonium in one place. Okay? <laughs> this is, in fact, a good idea not to do that because it has a tendency to explode. Plutonium-238, um, and, and, and I should, no, at this point I'll say, the reason I call this stupider Jupiter is because when I first wrote this up, I'm an astronomer. I'm actually not a nuclear physicist. I'm not an engineer who works on bombs. And so I actually wrote some things on my website that were wrong about how, how fission and fusion work, and I was pretty embarrassed about that. I had to rewrite a lot of what I was saying. And it actually made my arguments uh, a bit weaker. And of course, the fact that I had to admit my mistakes makes them weaker in the eyes of pseudoscientists who say, even these scientists can't get it right. In fact, that's what makes science strong when you admit your mistakes. Um, if you can ever find a pseudoscientist who admits when they're wrong, I think you're eligible for Randy's million dollar prize because that's a paranormal event. <laughs> but the reason this was a big deal is that the, the, there's this guy who posted this website who was saying that Galileo is going to be dropped into Jupiter. NASA was planning on doing this all along because Galileo has plutonium on it. Plutonium can explode like a, a fission bomb, right? To blow up a fusion bomb, the hydrogen bombs, you use a nuclear trigger of a fission bomb. It's the only way you can compress the hydrogen enough to actually get it to fuse like it would in the core of a star. So use a fission bomb to make a fusion bomb. And then if you make a fusion bomb, and Jupiter's mostly hydrogen. NASA wants to turn Jupiter into a star. <clears throat> Sadly, this is not the dumbest thing I've ever heard, <clears throat> but it's close. Um, and there's a series of, of mistakes, which I will outline in a moment. Um, one of the reasons this is a silly idea is, is this relatively accurate drawing of what Galileo would look like as it was plunging into Jupiter. This is actually from a pseudoscientific website, which I will mention in a moment. Um, I don't want to ruin it. But this is what Galileo is going to it looked like when it burned up in Jupiter's atmosphere in, Saturday, uh, in September. You will note that pieces of it are falling apart. Okay? Um, we have pretty good evidence that when things come into an atmosphere, they break apart. And Galileo is no exception. And so far from actually taking this plutonium and smashing it together to make a fission bomb, okay, as this thing burned up, it would actually scatter this stuff. And this actually was entering Jupiter's atmosphere at over 100,000 miles an hour. Now, um, not, to, not to bring this conversation down at all, but when the space shuttle re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, it's actually moving significantly slower than that, only about 20,000 or 25,000 miles an hour. And when Columbia blew up and when it, when it disintegrated because of atmospheric forces, it was scattered over a long way. Well, if you actually go four times that velocity and let this thing break up, it's going to have a much larger footprint, okay? So this stuff was scattered to, to everywhere all over Jupiter, okay? So there's really no way that this thing could have blown up like a bomb. And so I'm actually going to go through the steps of this. The plutonium on board really couldn't have exploded. I actually said initially that plutonium-238 can't explode at all. You can't make it explode like a bomb. That's actually not true. It actually can explode more easily than plutonium-239, which is what is used in weapons. Um, the problem is its half-life is so much shorter that it's actually very dangerous to try to make bombs out of it. Um, it tends to blow up on you when you're trying to do things with it. And it's highly radioactive. It's very dangerous. Um, but because Galileo re-entered so quickly, it actually dispersed that plutonium. So there's no way that it could have blown up, okay, because it was dispersed by entry. So even if it could, you know, blow up like a bomb, if there was some way to make it blow up like a bomb and configure it correctly, because you can't just slap this stuff together. You've really got to make it fit. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have blown up. It, it was dispersed anyway, so it couldn't blow up. Even if it was able to stay together somehow, the pressure, they, the, what they were saying is that as this plutonium sinks into Jupiter's atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure would be enough to, to compress it and make it explode. But the pressure wasn't enough to do that. There's not enough pressure in Jupiter to actually compress these plutonium pellets enough to make them explode. 
So that doesn't work. But let's say it could. Even if it could, you wouldn't be able to get a chain reaction. Because as soon as this stuff started getting enough energy to explode, the plutonium would actually be scattered. And once again, you wouldn't be able to, keep, to maintain this explosion very long because the plutonium would scatter, it's not contained, and so you wouldn't get an explosion, or a big explosion. But let's say it didn't fizzle out, even if it doesn't fizzle out. The other problem is that to make a fusion bomb, you need all sorts of extremely difficult situations to make. It's actually a miracle that these things can blow up at all. And ju while Jupiter is mostly hydrogen, you're not compressing that hydrogen by an explosion. You're actually, to, to, to make fusion, you have to smash hydrogen together. But if this thing were actually a plutonium bomb, right, the hydrogen's around it on the outside. So it would blow outward, right? So this doesn't quite work, sort of basic physics. Um, but let's say you do have containment to make the fusion. Jupiter doesn't have the right kind of hydrogen to fuse. You need isotopes of hydrogen, you need deuterium, you need tritium. The way hydrogen bombs work, and this is what I initially had wrong on my website about atomic bombs, is that you actually use lithium and, um, in, the, in, the f in the fission source, and when, when, the, uh, when, the, when the plutonium explodes, it actually bombards this stuff with x-rays, and the x-rays actually create the, 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 the hydrogen fuel that you need to fuse. So without actually having that initial trigger, you can't get the hydrogen bomb. This is how I understand it. I, I may actually, in fact, still be wrong, because this stuff is actually extremely complicated. So even if you could somehow contain this plutonium and go through all these steps, Jupiter doesn't even have the right kind of hydrogen to fuse. And the other thing is that even if you could fuse it, OK, as soon as you blew up this bomb, it's blowing outwards, OK? You'd have to compress Jupiter. We all saw the movie 2010, right? You need lots of monoliths to help compress Jupiter <laughs> to turn it into a star. You know, a, a, a little tiny bomb like this is not going to do it. As soon as you fuse hydrogen, it's going to explode outwards, and so it's not going to turn it into a star. So if you could somehow go through all of these steps, all of which are, in fact, you know, wrong, then yes, you can turn Jupiter into a star. You, you heard it here. So instead of getting a Jupiter's, you know, uh, Jupiter's shattering kaboom, what you would actually get was just a little fizzle as this thing burned up in the atmosphere. So it's pretty silly. So you'd, you know, once, once Galileo dropped into Jupiter in September, you would expect, oh, pfft, you know, this is all over. No, this is this, 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 it's just a non, another, another dumb non-pseudoscience event, and people will drop it. And if you think that, I don't know what you're doing at this meeting. <laughs> in October, a... And this is again true. A mysterious black spot appeared in Jupiter's atmosphere. You can see it right here. And here it is a little bit later. It's rotated a little bit, uh, half an hour later. Jupiter spins about every nine hours. And so these things move pretty quickly. This spot pops up, and everybody's wondering what it was. These amateurs, this is an amateur photograph, if you can believe it. The amateur equipment is really amazing these days. And everybody, the first thing people thought, oh, it's the shadow of one of Jupiter's moons passing in front of it. They cast a shadow on the, on the atmosphere. Um, but there were no moons at that spot that could cause this black spot. So this is something weird. You know, what, what could this thing be? Well, nobody was really sure. But I went on the web and looked up to see if there were any other black spots that had appeared on Jupiter before. So to continue the sting song, it's the same old thing as yesterday. In December of 1998, there was a black spot on Jupiter. You can see it here. Don't worry about these two pictures. That's just different, uh, showing different stuff. Here's a picture taken in, two, in, the, in um, October, November, and December of 2000. OK, this is not the black spot. This is actually the north pole of Jupiter where they couldn't get actual data. So that's actually a blank spot in the image. But you don't see the black spot here. Here is the actual black spot here. And then it's kind of fizzled out again over the next month. So what this, what this sequence of images is showing you is that a black spot can appear and fade away very quickly, which is exactly what happened to this spot here in December 98, and what happened to this spot that appeared in October of last year, a month after Galileo dropped into Jupiter. These spots come and go. Well, clearly, the timing of this black spot was important, right? And so we needed somebody to bring the truth out about this. And who better than Richard Hoagland? Just to make sure that's him on the right, presumably. <laughs> Richard C. Hoagland, pardon me. He immediately posted a, some stuff on his website about NASA trying to nuke Jupiter and turn it into a star. And reading this thing is, it's amazing, because he uses so much scientific terminology in his website that it really seems legitimate, until you actually you know, figure out what he's saying. And it's all kind of uh, crap, not to coin a word. And so he actually jumped all over this black spot. And he said, look, here is an image of this. He was saying that what this black spot was was the rising plume from Galileo. As Galileo sank into Jupiter, it blew up. It took a long time for it to sink. And when it got to a few hundred miles depth, the pressure was enough to make it blow up. And you got this expanding vapor.